Hello, Fudi Dashi listeners. In this episode, we take a look at a visual novel from 2019, the incredibly prescient Eliza. We spend some time laying out the unique mechanics of a visual novel and how those reading mechanics parallel the counseling methods the game interrogates. We also spend quite a long time thinking about the way the game reflects the culture of tech and the imperative to understand the ethical and cultural ramifications of being at the bleeding edge of software development. If you like what we do, you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash furidashi, where you will receive bonus content like an extra full episode every month. There's no need to feel obligated, though, and whatever you choose, we're glad you're here. And with that out of the way, let's get on with the show. Everyone and welcome to the Foodie Dashi Podcast. I podcast. I don't know why I got sassy there for a second. It's okay. We can just time out and let's just like start this over. No, no, no. The sass, the sass is staying in. It's a, it's a sassy day. We're gonna be sassarific, I guess. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I am Nicholas. I am here with my co-host and just like my visionary, my luminary, my game dev extraordinaire she's giving me the weird the dirtiest look right now i was gonna say extraordinary like at least you could have made it rhyme uh but like he said i'm lauren ash apparently i am yeah well enchante nicholas thank you Excuse, pardon me, madam. Uh, so with, with, with all of that, all of those pleasantries and sort of hyperbolic statements in mind, um, today we are going to be talking about therapy. We're going to be doing therapy on the podcast today because we're going to be talking about a visual novel from 2019 called Eliza. And I was the one who chose this one. Lauren did not choose this, although she did play it through in its entirety. So we're both, you know, completely knowledgeable of everything that happens in the game. But the reason why I wanted, I chose this is because it's a game that is on the one hand, kind of sort of about AI, but more broadly is about sort of like the position of human beings, ordinary human beings with relation in their relationship to technology in a way that I felt was sort of deeply humanistic and also very challenging with regards to a lot of sort of the ideas that tend to come out of Silicon Valley as just like accepted reality as if that's just the way things are. And also, so if there's a thesis for this episode, I wanted to sort of think about the way in which the game <clears throat> explores the this kind of inverted relationship between player and avatar, or rather sort of like it questions what the nature of that relationship is and how it works. And so along those lines, I think it's very important that it is a visual novel because visual novels also have this kind of like uneasy relationship with other, you know, so-called like mainstream quote unquote games. And another way of phrasing that too, because I know that like player and avatar can be very academic, um, is something that when we look at visual novels, for me at least, visual novels really let you get inside the heads of the characters. Yeah. And so this is really about the relationship, not just between the characters that you're reading about, but kind of the character of how you, right, through your dialogue choices, are kind of framing uh, Eleanor. Uh, is it uh, Eleanor or Evelyn? Evelyn, Evelyn. It's Evelyn. Excuse me. I was like, that's not right. Well, no, oh, it is. It, well, it's funny because it actually is a trope in the game that like e names keep getting like yeah, e names keep getting mixed up. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Evelyn, um, Evelyn is you, right? And in visual novels, you play a central character or a central figure. And I think for me, um, the dialogue choice, right, in what we're going to talk about on today's episode, right, with meaningful choices and what is meaning. Yeah. Um, 
which is also incredibly uh, like esoteric for our like therapy. What is meaning? That's very <laughs> existential. Anyway, yeah. uh, if we look at the thesis right through that lens, we kind of recognize it's not just about the difference between right the player and the avatar, like say necessarily your central character, right? It's actually about, for me, what is the relationship between the character you're playing, right? And also how people in the, uh, in the game uh, of Eliza perceive who that character should be. Exactly, right? And yeah. I think this game does an incredibly good job, right, in some aspects of creating what Nicholas calls the inverse relationship, where it's almost more about how people perceive you and you choosing a person um, almost over your sense of self in order to define who you, the Evelyn, right, you want to be going forward, which is very interesting when you talk about, right, Eliza, the video game and its its uh, predecessor that it was actually based on. Um, but Nicholas, I know you want to talk more about what visual novels are um, and how they are as a game. It's themselves. Yeah, sort of like as a before we get into the game itself, kind of, you know, in the past, we usually, this section is usually sort of like the history of a particular thing, usually a particular like game series. But this time around, I really wanted to talk about like what a visual novel is in terms of gameplay. Because I think sometimes people don't believe visual novels have gameplay, especially when they're like very heavily focused on, you know, just like constantly clicking through text, or they may have some like, uh, they may have some branching like choices that you, you can make. But it's generally assumed that, like, that is, like, okay, going back even a little bit further, you kind of see again and again a kind of broad, diffuse ide ideology, both within people who design games and amongst people who play them, that, like, a thing is, a, a piece of media is more game-like the more, quote-unquote, interactivity it has. The more buttons you push, the more choices you make, the more inventories you manage, the more character dialogue trees you have. Right. And I think <laughs> it's just game design as, as a medium has overtly almost relied on a lack of reading comprehension or even a lack of, say, speaking comprehension, right? Yeah. Um, even when, honestly, in the past, a game of chess could be have made much more dramatic if your opponent is constantly berating you. Right. Well, yeah. So well, I think that I, I think that what Nicholas is really getting out here, right, is that, you know, there are game mechanics of visual novels. They're just ones that we no longer, I guess, as an industry really think of as games. Which is actually, sad. yeah, that, that, that's a really good point. So, like, for example, recently I saw on Twitter, I can't remember who it was, but they had pointed out how amazing it is when they were playing Jedi Survivors that, like, you can go back and scroll, like, you get a history of all the dialogues that you have you know encountered so far and you can go back through and you can reread them that is like a core visual novel mechanic that has existed since like time immemorial and so to be like oh wow this is so cool and interesting the way they did this in this triple a game it's like that's literally just straight out of visual novels so yeah you're right they have mechanics but for whatever reason like they get invisibilized i guess is the way i would say i think they get invisibilized because it feels very very basic, right? It feels very rudimentary. And we don't do this with math, right? We're like one plus one equals two is actually a fundamentally great concept, right? Yeah. And we don't do this with Booleans and code zero being false and one being true. But for yeah. some reason, the art of reading <laughs> um, is so trivialized in a yeah. literate, right, uh, environment where everyone can read and they don't consider reading to be a skill and reading comprehension is a skill, right? It's on yeah. these standardized tests because reading between the lines, right? Actually deeply understanding what people are saying when they say it is a very, it's a, it's a skill. Well, yeah, because, yeah, I mean, in many ways we're, we're talking about two kinds of reading and the problem is, is that the second kind of reading people assume is the same as the first. So in the first yep. instance, there is just sort of the basic, like, you know, you go into a shop, you look at a menu, you read latte, and you know, if you say the word latte, then you're going to get a particular object from the barista that has a particular composition of milk and coffee. Um, but then there's this other kind of reading that we typically refer to constantly in academia, which is reading as analysis, reading as decipherment, and sort of like taking something that is stated 
and not just like accepting what it says at face value, but also recognizing that it may be allegorical, there may be implications, it may be sort of like a subtle reflection of certain like political aspects of society. Like there are all the different kinds of ways in which you can read an individual statement. And in many ways, a visual novel relies on that as yes. a game mechanic. And there's a lot of people who I think cannot play visual novels or don't get enjoyment from it because they haven't learned how to do that type of more analytical reading. Um, before we go super, super far into this, um, I just want to say that like this is a reason why learning languages, particularly learning to read languages, is incredibly hard for me because the part of my brain that wants to understand the cultural meaning of what people are saying yeah. is just it does not turn off. And I did never, I never learned actually how to say I'm sorry in Mandarin, um, which is the buji, uh, until I figured out that it was actually like, I am losing face. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God. Okay. Now I get it. Right. And that's so much more <laughs> cultural than that. But like, that is how I learn yeah. language. I don't learn language. Some people say I learn language literally, which means I learn the literal words, but I, I need that. And it's different than going, right, I'm sorry, and saying this sounds means I'm sorry. That's rote memorization, right? My yeah. brain's actually really kind of bad at that, even though I do have a good memory. I just need to know exactly like why it is what it is that I'm saying. So learning languages is hard, right? Because your brain needs to understand and comprehend these things. Yeah. And that's the mechanic of visual novels, right, is exactly. reading. Yeah. And I think that that's why people get the enjoyment is that while you just see someone clicking through dialogue text, the actual art of reading is an inherently different conception of that gameplay. And Eliza was so fascinating for me to play because well, yeah. of of those of the types of reading that I was able to do. Yeah, and I think it's important then that like as a visual novel, it is also then focused on like therapy and like how therapy is I'm going to use a terrible word for this, deployed in society. Because he, so for those of you who have not played Eliza, it's centered around this woman, Evelyn, as Lauren noted earlier, who was the primary dev on a sort of set of software that has a kind of AI component to it that is primarily going to be used for like individual counseling sessions. Um, a, a bad thing happens to a friend of hers. <laughs> well, actually, it's kind of brought up at the beginning. I think it's brought up at the beginning. I think we yeah. also, like, I wanted to just point out, I think we will be spoiling this. Yeah. Right? Throughout, because there's no really good way to talk about, like, the mechanics of the choice of the game design and the narrative design of this of this game without yeah. spoiling it. And I also wanted to mention that you, uh, as Evelyn, or not as Evelyn, but as the player, learn that she was the primary developer, as in she was the one that did most of the source code yeah. um, for this original product. So even though throughout the game, like there were multiple programmers right on it, like it was more that yeah. it was like a five percent right skunk works kind of team that then she ended up leaving after. Actually, I think we should talk about the team a little bit because yeah. sort of the, there were three primary programmers. There was Evelyn, there is her friend Nora, who is also a major character in the game, and there is a guy, Damien, who doesn't really appear in the game until the very end in a kind of flashback sequence, who is dead at the beginning of the story. And the reason why he is dead is because the process of working on this particular project and the stress that accumulated as a result and in many ways, it killed him. I mean, I'm just going to say it straight out. Like, that is what killed him. I mean, technically, he had, I believe it was like some sort of, it was like an embolism or something like that. But it's pretty clear that it was a direct result of the stress that he was experiencing. And Evelyn feels tortured, personally, by this fact, and basically completely checks out from the program entirely because she can't deal with she feels guilty because of the fact that like she didn't pay she feels like she didn't pay enough attention to what was going on with him she didn't try to like get him to stop or help him or do any of the, sort of like the basic human things that would have kept him alive and it's interesting that when she comes back into sort of like the world <laughs> the thing that she decides to do is to be a proxy for the very software she developed and that's kind of the start of the game's like first, I would say, choice for you yeah. is that 
as a proxy of the software Eliza, which is the software of the game and the name, the name of the game is based off the name of the software. Yeah. Um, is that you only follow prompts from an AI therapist who is listening to the client, right? Or the, the patient offer counseling. And many of them go like, hi, how are you? The weather is gray. Like, so you can see that it's a code kind of pretty much up front. And the, the program really just asks questions to try to get, right, the kind of client um, to kind of open up, right, about their yeah, lives. Exactly. And the first client you get is incredibly intense. Um, yeah. And is basically breaking down and through the program, and I, I hate like spoiling it because it is like a very key moment. Um, but at the same time, it's in the very beginning of the game, so I'm sorry. Uh, but but is that through the program, the program's like, I need you to tell me your name. Just I need you to talk to me like a human. Like in this world where everything's being taken over, I need you, right, to tell me who you actually are. And the program's like, okay, I understand that in order to calm this human down, I need to pretend to be the human and make the human do human things. Yeah. My name is Evelyn. It's like, yeah. is that really you? Yes, it's really me. But this is all prompted to you. Yeah. And so you're kind of seeing this really, this is what I call reading between the lines, right? Is you're really seeing not just how you, the character, slash you, the character, like the character are just following these prompts. There's no opportunity to deviate because um, you'll get fired if you do. Yeah. And then second, you can also see that the AI, right, is somewhat sophisticated. It's not yeah. just going back to its programming, right? It goes, hey, I'm listening to the client. The client is about to like get violent. And I need to prompt my proxy to calm him down by yeah. giving the client what they want. And that's super, super sophisticated. So now it's a really great tone setter for the state of AI in this world because Eliza yeah. is an artificial intelligence. Well, and it's and it's more than what it appears to be on the surface. Like as as the the visual novel progresses and as you go through the game, you start to realize that there is more to Eliza than meets the eye, and there is there are kind of ulterior motives, um, especially from the 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 leader of the company Skanda. The guy's name is Rainer, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. Who is is your kind of is is a, is a classic kind of Silicon Valley CEO type who has some really bizarre notions about like how technology is going to transform humanity and in many ways sees Eliza as sort of like a means to bring that transformation about it's it's very interesting i think that each character right has like a unique perspective and someone who yeah. i actually really connected with was erland because he yeah. was that bright eyed explain who erland is so erland is a recent graduate who i think just finished his master's or bachelor's or something in computer I sciences. A, I believe it was a master's, yeah. I believe it was a master's in computer science. Yeah, because he was like 23, I think, which would be yeah. more, more, I don't I don't know, 23. Yeah. He was just recent graduated. And he is now up, um, he is now the lead programmer uh, under Skanda, who is owned by Rainer, right? Yeah. And he is the one that has been now tasked to figure out what to do and how to understand Eliza, this AI. Yeah. But Erland is not only just a recent graduate, he's already being thrust into a world of ethical concerns for him. Yeah. Right. Eliza being an AI is an amalgam of human centric data. Right? Yeah. And also, right, is tasked with basically breaking down this human data and commodifying it. Yeah. And he feels very uncomfortable with that for lots of reasons, which we will not always, will not completely detail here yet. Yeah. But, um, it's very interesting that he kind of can recognize that this code, right, because it is made up of real human data, is not always like it, it doesn't make him feel comfortable, right? It's not it's not just code. Well, and so I think yeah. I think that what Erlen's like, what's really interesting though is Erlen's like kind of naivety about working for a very large tech company, being yeah. granted all of this power, right? And also being the third, I guess, lead programmer that's been hired in three years, right? So high yeah. turnover. And he's very, very young, right? Very energetic, has these different views about the world that you as like Evelyn can either kind of agree with, kind of disagree with. He's looking for you as a mentor figure. Yeah. And I think it's just of all of the characters, right? He is the one that is almost like the, I have to stop using this as a phrase, but the C-3PO of the game. Like he is the one that is the only one really calling out that in a non-violent way, that he's a yeah, part yeah, of the yeah. system. 
Yeah. And he's not just saying I'm going to be, you know, bullshit in the news headlines. I'm not going to angry be on Twitter. He's just like, hey, like, I am the every guy that is working for a large tech company where I kind of feel like I'm doing, I'm being duplicitous. Yeah. And help me with that? Question mark, right? And I, I think it's uh, through his text messages and through the questions that he has, um, it really sets up this nice foil and also gives you more insight into who Evelyn actually is as a character based on the options you have to engage with Erland. Because despite any you know, ethical forgivings or things, Evelyn herself, regardless, is a very much like, yeah, bro, tech companies are evil. Why are you thinking you can make a difference? Like that, yeah. and the ultimately, all of her answers are relating to why aren't you asking me technical questions? Why are you asking me moral questions? But the game itself is constantly Evan being charged with morality and yeah. I don't know. It's very cool. So Erland was my favorite. I prefer the endings where you get Erland. Um, let's, to let's me, that's let's canon. Focus, let's focus on <laughs> Erland then, actually, because there are because okay, so, this actually reflects a lot of what we're trying to say about sort of reading as a game mechanic. Because the, in order to actually understand what the game is doing and what you, the player, are doing within it, you have to understand the really complicated and subtle resonances of these relationships and the dialogues that take place. So in the relationship between Erland and Evelyn, there are also, oh my God, there's so many things. First off, Erland is essentially Evelyn's replacement, if you think about it, because the, the job that he performs at Skanda is the job that Evelyn would have performed if she had stayed. So, and Evelyn assumes that that is a purely like technical situation. And it's one of the reasons why, as Lauren noted, she's kind of confused and she's like, why aren't you asking me, you know, technical questions about how the software works and so forth. But the thing is, and then this is another facet of it, is that Erland is not just an Evelyn replacement. He's also a Damien replacement. Because in this situation, you have someone who is being tested emotionally maybe not physically in the way that damien was but like it's it's hurting him it is harming him like the the work that he is doing is harming him and he can feel that and he is reaching out to evelyn for a kind of moral and emotional support in the same way that people reach out to the eliza proc the eliza proxies themselves for that kind of support and so it puts her in this odd position of like at the same time that she's working for skanda in this like you know contractor position this underpaid contractor position at the same time she is also kind of put in a position in terms of like the themes and the narrative of trying to fix by proxy proxy being an important word there what happens to her friend damien to prevent that same thing from happening to this other individual who while maybe it's not going to necessarily kill him to continue working for Skanda, he does he is being harmed by it, even if he doesn't recognize it as harm. And Evelyn is strangely like in a position to, I don't want to say save him, but help him in a way that she felt like she couldn't help Damien. And that's never explicitly stated in the game. Like that only comes out of the game if you actually, and this is the thing, is that it only comes out of the game if you spend time, like if you stop and think about it and analyze it in that sort of that second type of reading that we talked about earlier. And the reason why it's very important for a game like this to be a visual novel then is because like if you were playing God of War, God of War is not designed for that. God of War is not the kind of game that allows for that kind of slow contemplative gameplay and that's actually kind of rare in games that that sense of like expecting your player to slow down maybe not progress right now and actually think about sort of like the the delicate pattern that is being constructed both in terms of like the actual plot but then also the sort of like the thematic relationships between characters you can't discern that quickly. You actually have to spend some time with it. And I, I, I get the impression that there are a lot of people that would viscerally abreact to being put in that kind of position as a player and to being 
because the thing is the game doesn't force you to do it you you literally can like flip through everything extremely quickly if you want to but then you're going to feel like it's a hollow experience you're going to feel like you didn't really get anything out of it yeah and i think i think what you're really trying to get out more is that like because i actually played it very quickly i'm also a very fast reader and i misclick and so i actually (laughs) had to go back and replay the scene where you actually meet erlen for the first time because i just didn't realize you could click on objects like i was tired it was late at night I'm playing in the dark and I literally was like, I just completely didn't see it. Like I didn't see the eye prompts and I was like, well, I'm done here. And I was like, oh damn it. Like I could have clicked on something, right? Yeah. Cause it goes into that screen where actually it is kind of point and click. You actually reflect on all of the items in here. And I think that you could click through it like that. You could not investigate everything. You could investigate everything. But when Nicholas says hollow, what he's actually referencing is you could read it like a book. Yeah. Right. And you could treat it like a book, right? But the lack of, and maybe if you are just reading a book, you would get some really good, um, like you would still have good reading comprehension. But there's this level of contemplation and reflection the reading itself is asking you to do because the dialogue itself does something that very clever like movies and TV shows do where it tells you exactly what someone would say in that situation. Like, hey, like who was Damien, right? That's a very yeah. innocent question. Who was Damien? And Evelyn answers like, oh, he was the lead programmer uh, with us. Yeah. But doesn't say that he was also her friend. Doesn't say that he got himself killed, right? Well, I heard yeah. that, you know, like the project really like burned him out. And then you're like, yeah, it really did burn him out. But what's great about this is that as a reader, right? And as a listener, because this is voice acted, yeah. but kind of, or if you were watching this as a TV show, you go, it kind of sounds like he died though, right? But no one's saying that. And so yeah. I think that's what we're talking about is, yeah, you could just read it, but if you don't think about what the characters are saying, that's what to Nicholas's point makes it right hollow, right? And it's yeah. not so much that it's hollow. It's just that by not reading into it, by not asking yourselves the questions that the characters are asking of you, right? That's the relationship. That's why it's almost an inverse relationship, right? Between yeah. the player yeah. and the characters is that the player is forced to almost be a participant alongside this cast. Well, yeah, or- you 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 actually have proxy relationships to the game that the characters within the game have to these various systems. And I don't want to get, that's that's a whole that's a giant can of worms right there that I don't particularly want to open right now. Maybe in the Patreon episode we'll talk more about that. Um, but like, and and it also goes back to why sort of it's focused on like therapy as sort of the thing that technology is trying to solve, because therapy classically is this thing where you have to sort of think very concertedly about the relationship between the therapist and their client. But then also there is both analysis that the therapist does, but then there's also self-reflection that the client has to do. And that, so strangely enough, you as a player at various times are sometimes in sort of like the subjective position of the therapist in having to try and sort of like analyze what the game is saying but you are also at times in the position of the client having to reflect upon like what is the significance of what is being said. And maybe if you are a particularly like an empathetic player, even then like using that to reflect on like, you know, your own situation in your own life and your own circumstances and how like we, okay. I, I'm, I don't, I don't want to necessarily throw the, the, the polygon reviewer under the bus for this, but I read the Polygon review of Eliza and the the reviewer said something that I thought was rather strange, which is that, so in the, um, the counseling sessions that you do for the Eliza system, at the very end, there's a screen that pops up that, you know, that there's a rating that appears and you can get a tip. And then there's all this, there's all this like gamified crap that, uh, that you, appears, you know, in your, these glasses that you're wearing as you're doing the sessions. And the Polygon reviewer said something to the effect of like, I didn't really see what the point of that was. It seemed kind of stupid. But anyone who has ever worked like a gig worker job, like for DoorDash or for Uber or for like any of these companies where like you have to use an app or a system that is sort of like overlaid onto your gig employment, they would have recognized that immediately. Because that's how that stuff works. That's what it means to be a proxy for sort of these broader like technological systems. And 
then if you are the kind of person who's worked those sorts of jobs, you could then use what is going on in that sort of like that therapeutic moment to reflect back onto your own life. And I think one of the things that is super, super clever about this game is the way in which it's not super didactic about those things. It puts them there because it expects you to reflect on them and to understand them. And you can't do that entirely with the game itself. You have to actually be a human being to play this game. <laughs> I know that sounds so strange. I don't I, think it's. I don't think it's that strange <laughs> because no, it's like, I think it is because we have a lot of things to. So the reason why it's not strange is that we do have automated QA testing. Like it's something that yeah. A lot of a lot of when we say automated is really just a way of running, say, a script that you've written in in a game, and it could be code, it could be a visual scripting language, but yeah. you write something that basically goes, "Hey, can you like play this level all the way through without you know hitching any bugs?" And it's just to see if it's playable. And yeah. what that means is like does all of the logic fire? And a lot of automated testing can be as rudimentary as like hit this trigger volume, trigger this next objective under this situation, trigger this objective, and then trigger this. And yeah. automated testing can literally just be as yeah, auto-completing all the objectives in a level, which will yeah. then proceed to load the next level. And that's just a test like loading, right? Yeah. But there are more sophisticated things where we don't need players to play the game. You could run an AI through a map just to see if there are bugs, right? Yeah. yeah. Are they getting stuck? Um, yeah. run an egg graphics processor over a level to see if there's video like hitches, right? Yeah. And so I think what's interesting to your point is like you actually have to be a human to play this game is it's more like kind of commenting, you know, on the notion that we it's not about just seeing if the experience is like functional, right? It's also yeah. about you actually have to step outside of yourself and do human like reflecting, right? And human like thoughts. Yeah. Right. You can't just mash buttons. And that's very human too, just so we're clear. Like twitch mechanics and you yeah. know, just doing a like head shooting a bunch of zombies after a really stressful day feels great. Okay. We're not saying that experience doesn't. But we are saying is that in a different way, right? You can't just um escape. And I think that that's actually kind of what I was getting at because it's kind of leading into a lot of what the characters I felt like that were trying to do throughout the game. Yeah. So like, it, it's weird. Like, it's because, well, here's the thing. All of the endings and, and without getting into what they specifically are, all of the endings with the exception of one are basically a form of escapism. Because the thing is, and in, and that's actually a problem. I mean, here is so I, this is my interpretation of the game. So Lauren, feel free to disagree. But so Evelyn begins the game having already engaged in a very radical form of escapism. Like something terrible happens to her and to a friend of hers, and she she can't. She 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 just can't. So she checks out, like kind of from her entire life. And then when she sort of like slowly eases her way back into her life, when you get to sort of like the prime, the major decision point at the very end of the game where you sort of like decide what Evelyn is going to do with her life from that point forward, nearly all of them are forms of escapism. So just to, to pluck one out of the air, like if you decide to go back and work for Skanda, because that's one of the options, um, you... But it's you know you go you work on Eliza you become you know sort of the lead dev again, and you it's a great success and you basically bring the singularity into being which is you know it's kind of silly, but what's really interesting is how, like Evelyn's affect in that ending and the way she like responds she becomes almost robotic. And there is this weird moment where she literally says, the game literally says, I think it's like an, I'm an avatar. I have it written in my notes. So let me. No, that it is. It says, she says, um, this like is now, the ending with the singularity, right? Yeah. She yeah, says, so now, I, is... now I'm the avatar of something new. Like she says, she herself is an avatar of this AI singular, whatever, like whatever Eliza is evolving into. Like she is the avatar, she is birthing it into being. That's the way she sees herself. So it's weird that she. I now... appreciate that. Uh... 
that maternal sort of birthing <laughs> into existence sort of. I don't, I it's don't, okay. It's it's ingrained yeah, in our culture. Yeah, you're right. That's right? Sexist, that women <laughs> are just like facilitators, right? I mean, I do think it's true, right? As Evelyn is also yeah. a woman, you play a woman. And right? it's important. Yeah. And the thing is, yeah. like, also, there was this weird. So, in an earlier conversation that she has with Rainer, Rainer actually calls her Eliza as if she herself is synonymous with this system. I mean, you can read it as just kind of maybe a, a Freudian slip, but it's a kind of telling one because what Rainer wants from Evelyn is to essentially like plug her back into the system that is the entirety of Skanda in order to like shepherd, I, I, shepherd is another bad word, <laughs> to sort of like shepherd the evolution of this thing that is going to become the sort of like general what what do they call it agi like um artificial general intelligence this this thing that is going to be sort of like society wide and it's just going to control everything but in but the thing is she's kind of always been an avatar of some kind of system because the if you look if you really sort of think very concertedly okay, about that was like, a little bit of a leap here so just, yeah. just i mean it wasn't actually a leap but just for our listeners out there um this ending right with rainer where yeah. eliza goes back eliza wow i just did it Evelyn goes <laughs> back to, uh, Skanda to work on eliza right yeah. i think it's incredibly important that we recognize the loss of self in that moment yeah because it is a loss of self for something greater and what that something greater is a piece of tech is a piece of software yeah. right, is a piece of artificial general intelligence, right? Yeah. But it's also, right, personifying it. And I think that's what was crucial about yeah. Rainer calling uh, Evelyn Eliza. Yeah. Because he was personifying, right, Eliza as a human already because it is made of human data. Yeah. I think I want to call back to Erland, right, who also was humanizing it because it is, right, a bunch of humans' memories, yeah. right? But in a different way, he was doing it and saying it's wrong to use it, right? Versus Rainer is going, it is human. It is going to become more than human. It yeah. is going to become the singularity. Yeah. And also that when he like basically put right Evelyn as equals Eliza, he was like, Eliza is like the next stage of almost like Evelyn's evolution. And I think that this yeah. is very twisted. And so I yeah. just want to kind of highlight that before we go into your leap there, Nicholas, because knowing and understanding, I think what we're saying is now knowing all of that, you understand this, not quite a leap anymore. Right now we're stepping yeah. into the, so please continue. So, so the reason why this represents a kind of escapism is because as you just said, it's sort of like the abrogation of her being. Yes. In, in, instead of, so it, it, it dehumanizes her in the literal sense, maybe in the figurative sense as well, but in a very literal sense, it dehumanizes her. It turns her into, you know, to use another tortured metaphor, a cog in a machine. But the point that I was sort of getting to earlier, and I'm actually kind of glad that you inter interrupted me, is that she has been in that position for some time. And I'm not even just talking about like as a proxy for Eliza, you know, in the work that she's been doing at the counseling center, but that was also kind of true from the very get go. And so then the fact that like her response, like you see it in Damon, and I think she saw it in Damien too, that like Damon was a, being like ground down quite literally by the work that he was doing. And that like, he was in a sense dehumanizing himself. And that the only way for the project to progress was for that sort of thing to take place in the very people who created and developed it. Right. And he, and I think Damien represents when you learn who he was almost before that, you realize he wasn't someone who was always trying to be a hard worker or was that successful guy yeah. that really crunched the long hours. Like he was a naturalist. In, in in the flavor of this game taking place in Seattle, a big city, right? Yeah. Like he went out into the woods, which everyone in PNW does. So like that's not a big deal, guys. <laughs> yeah. And I think that when you look at though, right, he escaped to the woods. Like it starts, right, with them escaping outside of the city in order to go back so that they can right change the world. You see him actually as an idealist, which connects him further right to Erland. And I think that when we look at this kind of, you know, playing games in of itself, right, is kind of escapism. 
when you look at that dehumanization, I think it's just really important to see the ending of who Damien was at the end. And then now he's been ground down to such a state yeah. that this is also reflective of an Evelyn. Evelyn left, I think, to avoid that. Also, right, maybe it was an omission of guilt on her part. Like she noticed yeah. this was happening, did nothing. Yeah. yeah. And that throughout the game, and almost because it is an interactive game, Evelyn is just an avatar of all the other characters' wishes. Yeah. And I think that's that's what's really crucial, particularly at the ending choice, because it's about who do you decide to escape with? Or do you escape kind of with yourself or almost for yourself in a way? Um, yeah, because I mean, yeah, there's, there's one where there is an option where you just bug So we talked about Rainer's. We, yeah. yeah, we talked about Rainer's ending. So sorry to interrupt you, but we talked about Rainer's. There are two yeah. other, say, choice ones, I would say, between Soren and Nora. Yeah. That are also very different flavors of it. Yeah, because in each case, you're, it's sort of like it, with Rainer, Sora, it's Sora. <laughs> God, <laughs> that, now that's a Freudian slip. Rainer, Nora, and Soren, um, in each of those cases, she's essentially sort of like giving up her own desires for like someone else's motivation, someone else's goals. In the case of Nora, I mean, it's like to you know become closer friends, maybe even possibly lovers. It's kind of hinted at, it's suggested. Um, but then also then you learn to like make music in the way that Nora makes music. But then you're do it's Evelyn doing Nora's thing. And then in the case of Soren, Soren is now working on this even more bizarre wellness project. And again, it's like, well, do you go to work on his project? And I won't get into why it's bizarre and stupid. But the point is that in each of these three cases, you're doing someone else's thing. Yeah. And I will say that Soren's ending was actually the most shocking one to me. Yeah, I could see Rainer's creepiest. coming a mile away. Yeah. But Soren's... I didn't actually think it would take the turn that it did because I kind yeah. of, I was like, oh, I know what this could be, et cetera. But then the way Soren marketed it, I was like, holy hell, that yeah. would actually <laughs> get launched in today's society. It's a and little I also, too real. It's a little too real. <laughs> and also I was like, and I could also see myself using it. Yeah. I'm out. This game is too real. I am going to <laughs> not play any more endings. And, and that is why why we will not spoil Soren's ending at least. No, no, uh, so spoil. don't choose Soren, uh, but also do so that you get this or watch it. I, you know? No, I, I, I want to spoil one more because so when I was saying earlier that nearly all the endings reflect some form of no, we will spoil it? one more. I just don't want to spoil Soren. There is one that doesn't. There is one that doesn't, which is perfect. And it's Ray. Ray's is, I think there are two real endings. Like it's, Ray, yeah, it's, it's kind of complicated. Well, because the thing is, like, okay, it's complicated. So no, no, it's complicated. It is complicated. Ray's ending, though, to me, felt like the one that Evelyn, if she wanted to stay, kind of like a part of a system, she would stay as a part of a system that she chose. If that makes any sense, yeah. And it's like a return to form, which was of the beginning. She started as a proxy. She ends as a proxy. Well, I don't think it's just a proxy thing. It's because, okay, the, the beginning of the game poses a central problem, which is that Evelyn has disconnected from, you know, like the social world around her and is trying to find a way to reconnect to it. And Ray's ending is the only one that actually does that. It's the only one in which she is doing a thing that she discovered along the way through the course of the narrative and so then as a result it i don't want to say that it, it feels the happiest but it definitely feels like it's the one where evelyn has actually confronted herself whereas in all of the other endings it's about sort of confronting something else even the one where she like even the the total bug out ending where she decides to go to japan it's more kind of like confronting like an absent father and like she's still sort of externalizing what her like what her ultimate concern is whereas with the ray ending it is the one where it's like i i meaning evelyn know what i want to become not what i'm going to do either for someone else to someone else. like it's the only one where sort of there's a focus on her being and her like subjective situation and so I don't want to say it's a true ending per se, but it is the one that stands out. And I think because it stands out, it actually requires the most scrutiny. Also, because it is the only one that also includes 
the game's primary gameplay loop because you do a session in the in the ray ending and that session is a recapitulation of that very first one the super scary weird one that lauren meant that talked a lot about earlier like there is a kind of book ending quality to it yeah as a and his name is darren <laughs> And yeah, I noticed it's that super, because it's, yeah, it's not it's super, super close. close to Damien. Yeah, yeah. Like, I was but like, that, but, oh, this, this guy's name is Darren. That, but the fact that it's super close but not is precisely why I think the two are obviously related. Because, you know, Eliza, Evelyn, Erland, Evelyn, Erland, Eliza. Like, the fact that there's sort of like a degree of separation and yet sort of an eerie similarity. Those are the sorts of things that you can only discover through the actual gameplay mechanic that the visual novel is using, which is your sense of analysis, your discernment, your reflection, all of those things that are kind of like simpatico with classical psychotherapy. Yeah, and I think it's what's 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 really great about I think the Ray ending is that's the ending where I was like I think this is what Evelyn would have chosen for herself. Yeah. And I think that's also really telling is that the other endings don't feel like Evelyn. They feel like another form of escapism. They feel like you're yeah, confronting yeah. the problem. Exactly. What I do really like about the whole bug out ending is that it felt like Evelyn knew that there was something else she needed to confront. Yes. Which is why yeah. it gave her the challenge of, I need to confront my history right? Or my absentee father, which is a little bit of a bug out as a writer as well. Like you decide but, but to it, bug out and go to Japan, but at least like it's it's not just a bug out. It's like a bug out with purpose. Yeah. That's why I said it's a little bit, it's it's complicated precisely because it can, um, you can read it as a form of escapism, but it is also, it's a, it's a form of escapism that is also still confronting some aspect of herself. Something right. And it's the only her. other self ending. Yeah, yeah exactly. Rather Versus than, Rather than like trying to confront these like tense relationships and what are essentially motivations coming from other people. Right. And I think that when we look at that kind of like the interrelatedality of the fact that one of the endings actually has a game loop in it, right? Yeah. The fact that all of the others are really just reading about what happens to Evelyn after the fact. Yeah. You actually have some of the game loop also in the let's bug out and go to Japan ending. Because you actually talk to Erland and you offer him advice. Right oh, that's you right. Meet. I had forgotten so while about you're, that. So while you're not an Eliza proxy, you actually also have the game loop of talking to Erland. Like you yeah. actually choose things. Now there is some like dialogue choice, I think, with Nora's as well. But I, 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 yeah, not, but it's I think like, it's more like flirting about the music qualities. Like Yeah, and it's not really that different from the dialogue choice that you have like with Rainer. Like there, there And it's some... not the dialogue choice with Rainer either. Yeah. And yeah. I think with Soren's you absolutely deny Evelyn oh, all, yeah, 100%. all choice. Yeah. A hundred percent. Which yeah. is the strongest right um loss of sense of self or sense of 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 thing. Um yeah. I was going somewhere with this and I completely forgot where I was going, but I'm glad that at least I ended on like the sense of self of who Evelyn is and the game loop you also have with your conversation with Erland because yeah. it's like the final – and the reason the reason why I brought that up was that if Erland is a, like a Damien, right, and Evelyn mix – yeah. The conversation you have with him is basically, you're not telling him to leave the company, but it's basically you're telling him like, hey, you need to decide if this company is the right place for you because yeah. I don't think that it is and it's going to destroy you. And so you're actually like paying it forward right before you leave. Like you're not meeting with Nora. You're not meeting with Ray. You're not, well, you're not going to meet with Rainer or Soren in this case. You're like, fuck off. But <laughs> yeah, I think sure. that, right, you're not meeting with someone who was your best friend, Right. Um, and who kind of was becoming more of a closer friend to you, right, throughout the game. You're meeting with Erland. Yeah. You're meeting with the one guy you know you have an impact on that will actually change their life because everyone else's lives are set. And so I think that's what's really beautiful about it is that – and it is because of his youth. It's because of the way the narrative has the parallelism to Damien. But it's the fact that even if Evelyn did not choose to be a proxy, she's still kind of, right, that advisor figure in the yeah. other ending, right? Which just goes to show, like, the core of who Evelyn was, but also then why, right, the gameplay, the nature of the story, and the way the other characters treat her is of an avatar and a facilitator of everyone else's needs, desires, and wishes, yeah, the avatar thing is really interesting because it actually goes back to something that 
a part of the show notes that we completely glossed over that I'm kind of glad we did, but I want to bring it a part of it up briefly. So Eliza, the name of the software is actually derived from a chat bot that was created by a guy named Weizenbaum, I think is his name, Joseph Weizenbaum. Yeah. And it's modeled and it's a, it's a form of natural language processing that was modeled on uh, Rogerian psychotherapy. So Carl Rogers was this guy who created, a, this is quick and dirty, created a kind of psychotherapy that was kind of like anti-analysis or like anti-diagnostic is usually the way he characterized it. And the whole point of the therapist in sort of like the therapeutic relationship was not to do sort of like the classical thing that you would do in psychoanalysis, which is to sort of like decipher what your client is saying and sort of like impart meaning to them, but rather sort of to create the conditions under which the client will come to a realization of what they're saying and what they're doing for themselves so that they in their own lives can become there's a lot of like language of being sort of like maladjusted and so forth which i'm not want to get into that. there are a lot of problems with rogerian psychoanalysis but the basic ideology is like how do i as the therapist create the conditions for my client to do the work themselves and so then when you see this ending with um, Evelyn and Erland, it's important that like Evelyn has one finally realized what Erland actually wants from her, which is a kind of like moral support. And so she, in recognizing that her response is not to tell him what to do in the way that in many ways, like Nora kind of like is imposed. Like I agree with Nora's politics mostly, but she is very sort of like, this is the way you have to see things <laughs> like, at, especially at the beginning of the game. Whereas Evelyn's response to Erland is like, no, you actually have to take a stand and you have to determine what that stand is. And so the fact that like the therapeutic system that it sort of recurs throughout the game is itself modeled on Rogerian psychotherapy is kind of reflected in the fact that like at the end, what it seems, at least in that ending, it seems like what Evelyn has gotten out of the experience is a realization that like she is the facilitator of someone else. She can be the facilitator of someone else's growth or in the Ray ending, she can be the facilitator of her own growth. Like in many ways, she, in that ending, she adopts that kind of like standoffish relationship to herself and allows her to sort of like not take for granted all of the things that she had assumed up until that point. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because it goes back to what we were saying earlier about sort of like in the in the ending with Rainer, where Evelyn says, like, you know, I am now an avatar of something greater. Like, it's almost like she doesn't understand what an avatar means in that instance. Because if you think about like in a game, the way an a like avatars are sort of typically defined, the avatar is sort of like the point of contact between the player and the game systems. So then what does it mean for then the player to become that point of contact itself? And Evelyn, and in her relationship with Erland, but also in her relationship with other characters as well, kind of demonstrates what that signifies. Because one of the things that comes up early on in the game is that they actually had problems with the initial deployment deployment of Eliza simply as just like software, just as a chatbot, and that when they started using human proxies, people were far more accepting of it because of the way in which now sort of like the person functioning as the avatar of the system is that point of contact, like the point of contact, you know, between a player and, and a game for the client. And I don't want to necessarily want to say that, like, you can extend this metaphor too far. Like, the client isn't playing you in the way that, like, you know, a player sort of manipulates an avatar in a game. But it does provide that point of entry, that point of access. Because a lot of times when clients come into psychotherapy, they don't necessarily know what they're supposed to be doing. They don't necessarily know how to approach things. And in the same way that, like, the client looks to the psychotherapist for that kind of, like, scaffolding, like, to how to deal with their problems... Erland is looking to Evelyn for a similar kind of moral scaffold scaffolding to deal with the ethical problems that he has to address. And Evelyn, like, is uniquely positioned, not just being, right, the primary programmer, right, 
yeah. also being when she does come back, being acknowledged by Rainer, right, the company CEO, that she is, right, the primary programmer, and even being offered, right, to tour and say, meet Erland, right, face to face um, about this program. She herself only recognizes her own avatar and facilitation like quality. And I think, while well, she say maybe explicitly calls it out in Rainer's ending, I think she herself as a character only recognizes it in the Ray, right? The yeah. I'm going to become a counselor ending or even in the bug out ending because she gives, right, Erlen to the feedback that she gives. She recognizes, right? Or rather, yeah. as a as a, an analytical reader myself, you recognize that she had to do that. Yeah. Um, moving this on and wrapping it up because I cannot have said it any better than Nicholas just <laughs> ended it right there. I did want to say thank you all for listening. And also, if you are a Patreon subscriber, thank you so much for subscribing to this. The reason why we are talking about Eliza today, as strange as it is in that we don't normally talk about visual novels too frequently, and we don't also get super esoteric, is that the launch of ChatGPT 3.5 and the kind of very, uh, this was not planned, um, but the very like <laughs> no. coalescing of the, the I don't know, like uh, the sons uh, with me also like <laughs> needing to study a little bit about AI for just, just in general for work. Yeah. Um, but also then looking at uh, the chat GPT 3.5, all of my friends talking about how that they're using it instead of Google, right, as a way to um, search the internet. Also Bing chat being used by Microsoft overtook Google for like the first time in decades, like yeah. Bing for all and purposes. <laughs> Freaking I mean, Bing. <laughs> yeah, but because of chat GPT, right? That we just happened to choose to play Eliza around the same time as, um, I think that was March, but it really was April. And I guess now we're in May, right guys? Yeah. But, but the fact that like this has been going on, like it's in the center of the forefront of Twitter, of all of the technology that we just accidentally chose an AI game to play as this was happening. But now it's really important, right? Is that AI becomes not just a facilitator of our own right experiences, maybe in music or movies or Twitter or chat GPT, but will also right now become something that could facilitate things like the things that Eliza, right, in 2019 uh, was trying to solve. Yeah. And it's a little frightening, um, <laughs> but it's well, also... But it's also something really, it's worthwhile to talk about. Well, if you want to join us, if you all want to join us to have a cozy conversation about the terrors of AI as they relate to games and game design, we'll be having that conversation in our Patreon episode, which will be coming out the week after this one. You can also follow us on Twitter at the at Fudidashi Pod. You can follow Lauren at the Lauren Ash. You can follow me at Academicality. You can go to our Substack, gamedesigndiscourse.substack.com, where I, the great marvelous Nicholas, have <laughs> <laughs> sorry, have have been have been discussing um narrative mapping and the way in which you can think about game design in terms of narrative mapping. And if any of those things are of super interest to you and you want to support our work, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash foodidashi. You can sign up at the five dollar tier, you can sign up at a, in an elevated tier and you can get even more of me saying weird things about game design and ux because finally my specialty actually gets to get infused into the podcast but you're gonna have to pay for that because it's my friggin job <laughs> yay <All right. laughs> and with all of that guys thank you so much listen to you next time here at furudashi pod mm -hmm.